In 1799, General Napoleon Bonaparte launched a coup against the French Revolutionary Government and became the supreme leader of France. By 1804, he declared himself the nation's emperor. Napoleon is famous for the many different wars fought during his reign, and today they're even named after him, the Napoleonic Wars. By 1807, he had led France to controlling the majority of Europe. But a major factor of this time period that's not often discussed is the relationship of Napoleon and the Catholic Church. The Church was the major religion of Western Europe, and Napoleon often came into conflict with this holy institution. Both Napoleon and the Church wielded their own power in France. Napoleon was the political and military leader of the nation, while the Church led the faith of most French citizens. The Emperor wanted to remake France and all of Europe to his own vision. As time went on, Bonaparte would try to bend the church to his will by extreme measures. He even ended up taking a pope prisoner. But instead of forcing the church into submission, he would learn exactly why the Catholic Church has remained an independent force for 2,000 years. We live in a time today where there's a growing effort to force Christian religious values to conform to whatever values are popular in the moment. The struggle of Napoleon and the Church provides a valuable example of how the Church faced overwhelming pressure to change, but stood firm in its doctrines. I think that many of us can take inspiration from these events. In this video, I'll be explaining exactly how the Catholic Church and Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte engaged in a battle of wills for the soul of Europe. To understand Napoleon and the Church, we first need to understand the Emperor that Napoleon considered his predecessor. Charlemagne. Charlemagne was a European emperor from the 8th century whose empire, the Frankish Empire, stretched through France and Germany. He was the most powerful ruler Europe had seen since the Roman Empire. On Holy Saturday, 774, he entered Rome to meet with the Pope and strengthen ties between the Franks and the Papal States. For those who don't know, the Papal States were territories in Italy that the Catholic Church ruled directly over. This was also known as the Temporal Power of the Pope. Charlemagne always kept good relations with the Pope and even donated him some land. For the rest of the Middle Ages, the Church held this land and worked with the kingdoms of Europe to create just, honorable, and spiritually healthy societies. In the late 1700s, Europe was about to get a new Charlemagne. Napoleon Bonaparte was born in Corsica in 1769 and was educated at military schools in France. He spent his free time researching the history of Corsica and the philosophers of his time, especially Rousseau. His upbringing led him to adopt a form of deism. While he admired the personality of Jesus, he grew up a stranger to all religious practices. His persona during the French Revolution was a citizen devoted to the new ideas. In the 1790s, Napoleon rose through the French military as an extremely talented commander, who earned stunning victories and the loyalty of his soldiers. Bonaparte's constant victories led him to believe that he was chosen by destiny to eventually rule over Europe. He thus gradually became one of the most ambitious men in European history. While this was happening, the Catholic Church had suffered extreme persecution during the Revolution. The infamous civil constitution of the clergy had tried to enslave the Church to the secular French state. Most within the Church refused to obey. Thousands of clergy were deemed enemies of the Republic and deported or killed. Churches were closed, monasteries confiscated, and even the Christian calendar was thrown out. But, as the years went by, something interesting happened. Despite the brutal crackdowns on the church, Catholicism was rebounding in France. Christianity is a religion that tends to be awakened under severe persecution. The Pope and the church had stuck to their principles even after all of these horrible events, and many in France recognized this and respected it. Henri Jacques Clark, a brigadier general and ally of Napoleon, wrote to him that, We have once more become Roman Catholic in France. Napoleon, for his part, didn't share the extreme anti-Christian views of the Jacobins. He had a much more diplomatic approach to religion. As a general, whenever the Directory gave him demands to destroy the Papal States, he would always offer far lighter peace terms than what they wanted. He wrote in a letter at the time, I am more ambitious to be called the preserver than the destroyer of the Holy See. When he fought the Papal States, he forbade any insult to religion and showed kindness to the priests, even to French refugees in the country who he could have had shot as émigrés. As a young general, Napoleon was always careful not to tread upon Catholicism's spiritual importance. Napoleon eventually reached a level of power where he could act independently from all the politicians back in Paris. 
he continued to defeat foreign armies and negotiate his own peace treaties. But back at home, the religious situation in France was about to get a lot worse. The Directory enacted a coup against pro-Catholic politicians who wanted to restore the church in the country. This led to a new wave of anti-Catholic policies from the government. While this went on, Napoleon was engaged in his Egyptian campaign, which saw him conquer Cairo from the Ottoman Empire. But back at home, the religious policy of the Directory was provoking serious troubles. Deportations of priests were multiplying. Belgium, where 6,000 priests were deported, rose in rebellion. Vendée, Normandy, and the southern territories of France were rising. The nation was angry and uneasy. In wars abroad, Britain and Austria were also driving back the Directory's troops. Bonaparte realized in Egypt that this was his moment and rushed back to France. He arrested key directors, broke up the legislature, suspended the constitution, and utterly dismantled the Directory government. He would now rule as one of three consuls. But really, since he had uncontested control of the military, the Napoleonic Emperorship had already effectively begun. Two of Napoleon's first moves were to seek peace with all of the religious rebels who had been persecuted by the Directory. He authorized the return of the non-constitutional priests to France, as long as they simply promised loyalty to the laws of the Republic. In June 1800, he won a stunning victory at Marengo, crushing the Austrians. This victory was crucial for two reasons. First, it reversed France's losing position in the War of the Second Coalition. And second, it proved to France that Napoleon was capable of leading the country. Bonaparte spent 1801 and 1802 enacting internal reforms in France. The Code Napoleon was created to formally introduce some of the principles of 1789 into French law, thus completing the civil results of the revolution. But it was also Napoleon's desire that, in this new post-revolution society, the church should have a place, and consciences should be cleared. Napoleon opened negotiations with the new pope, Pius VII. He ordered his papal representative to treat the pope as if he had 200,000 men. The Vatican was cautious because they knew full well that many in Napoleon's government were former revolutionaries who were heavily influenced by irreligious values. This included Napoleon himself. However, they eventually negotiated the Concordat of 1801. The Concordat went through months of fierce negotiation. At one point, Napoleon even tore up a draft and threw it into a fire. But finally, in April 1802, it was published. Its most important stipulations were this. It recognized Catholicism as the main religion of France and restored much of its civil status. It wouldn't be the religion of the state like it had been under the monarchy, but it would receive certain protections. The French government would nominate bishops, but the Pope retained the power to accept or reject them and church officials would receive financial compensation for property seized during the revolution. The law finally ended the schism between constitutional priests and non-constitutional priests. It's hard to say which side gained more from the Concordat. On the one hand, the church was once again able to operate freely in France without fear of persecution. The Pope was recognized as having full spiritual power over the French church, an important distinction since Gallicanism had previously been popular. The Concordat dashed the hopes of powerful Protestants who wanted to make Protestantism the religion of France. On the other hand, Napoleon gained the religious peace that he had so much strived for. Most Catholics were now at peace with the Republic that had just a few years ago been killing them. Monarchist movements that wanted to completely undo the revolution and restore the Bourbon dynasty were severely weakened. But, as was typical of his nature, Napoleon wanted even more power. He immediately began enacting policies that violated the spirit of the Concordat and offended the church. For example, he created a document in secret called the Organic Articles that gave the state more power over the church than was agreed upon in the Concordat. Its stipulations were serious intrusions of secular power into the church, attempting to regulate the number of priests, what they were taught, and even how they dressed. Pope Pius VII immediately announced that he hadn't accepted this document but Napoleon ignored his complaints. Fortunately for the church, many of the laws in the organic articles were never enforced and it mostly became a dead letter. But the threat of it being fully enforced was a threat that Napoleon now held. His government would also go on to recognize both Protestantism and Judaism as valid religions in France. Things were calm for now, but the seeds of future conflict were certainly being sown. For a time, the church in Napoleon's France found harmony. Through the next few years, many Catholic sisterhoods were recreated. 
and Napoleon even named his mother protectress of all hospital sisters. Catholic education, conducted by the clergy, flourished. Napoleon funded grand seminaries and placed Oriental Christians under the protection of France. All of this was happening in the context of a European diplomatic situation that was becoming increasingly tense. The War of the Second Coalition ended in 1802 with a French victory, but the peace it created was uneasy. No one besides France was happy with the new European balance of power. In 1803, France invaded UK-controlled Hanover, and the two countries re-entered war. As you can probably tell, during this time period, France and Britain were almost always at war over something. Napoleon became obsessed with finding a way to defeat Britain once and for all, and he viewed them as his arch-nemesis. He began taking extreme actions to counter British and royalist influence, such as executing a popular Bourbon duke, who was abducted from Germany and executed in France for supposedly conspiring against Napoleon. This outraged the monarchies of Europe and led to even the Tsar of Russia feeling it necessary to check France's power. Now at this point, some may be wondering, like many in the French Revolution, was Napoleon a Freemason? Just to give a reminder of what Freemasons are, they're a secret society that promotes a naturalistic and deistic form of religion that's often anti-Catholic. Napoleon was not a member. However, he did allow the organization to operate openly. Masonic lodges sucked up to him throughout his reign, with some even displaying his bust and referring to him as Saint Napoleon. According to one source I read, Freemasonry experienced a golden age during Napoleon's reign. As you can imagine, this was another dividing line between him and the church, who had banned Masonry among Catholics. So then what was Napoleon's ideology? He mixed revolutionary ideals and traditional ideals. At the end of the day, he was pro-France and pro-Napoleon. For his entire reign, he had to contend against royalists, republicans, and nationalists alike. In his personal life, he was a serial adulterer and would eventually even divorce his first wife, Josephine. Napoleon declared himself emperor in mid-1804 in Notre Dame. Throughout history, popes would crown kings, but Napoleon placed the crown on himself. This was embarrassing to Pius VII, who had only attended the event to show his goodwill to the new emperor. While he was in France, the Pope also drew up a list of the papacy's wishes from Napoleon. Catholicism should be recognized in France as the official religion, France's new divorce law should be repealed, and all church orders that were abolished during the revolution should be re-established. But Napoleon rejected most of Pius' proposals. The most he agreed to was to restore the Christian calendar over the revolutionary calendar. Pius VII ultimately left France in 1805 disappointed and displeased by Napoleon's lack of concessions. Through 1805, France fought the War of the Third Coalition against Britain, Russia, and Austria, and it ended in disaster for the anti-French powers. Austria and Russia were defeated in a series of battles including the famous Battle of Austerlitz. The war ended in a French victory which left the nation in a stronger position than ever before. The Peace of Pressburg between Austria and France made France the dominant power in Germany. In the wake of this, Emperor Francis II of Austria abdicated his title of Holy Roman Emperor. To quote the historian George Goyou, Thus ended, under the blows dealt it by Napoleon, that Holy Roman Germanic Empire, which had exerted so great an influence over Christianity in the Middle Ages. The Pope and the German Emperor had long been considered as sharing between them the government of the world in the name of God. At this point, Napoleon had solidified himself as master of the continent, but the British destroyed the French navy at Trafalgar, making them the master of the sea. The two countries remained at war. 1806 would be the turning point in Napoleon-Church relations. Napoleon had become irritated that the Pope wouldn't join him in war against his enemies. He demanded that the Catholic Catechism declare him the image of God upon earth and the Lord's anointed. Liberal policies he spread to the territories he conquered, such as legalizing divorce and granting privileges to other religions, further displeased the church. Prisons began to fill with priests who were judged to have disobeyed his orders. To prevent a landing of English troops in Italy, he ordered the papal city of Ancona to be occupied. This was an illegal action that infringed upon the pope's sovereignty. The pope now had a difficult decision. If he joined Napoleon, he would lose all goodwill with France's opponents and risk becoming a French vassal. He would basically be at Napoleon's mercy. If he resisted Napoleon's domineering, he could try to maintain the church's independence and international goodwill. 
He also could work to prevent any changes Napoleon might try to make to Christian doctrine. The Pope thus chose to resist. He protested against France's arbitrary exercise of power. He complained in a letter to the Emperor of this cruel affront, declared that since his return from Paris he'd experienced nothing but bitterness and sorrow, and threatened to dismiss the French ambassador. Napoleon responded with angry letters complaining of the Pope's ill will. He declared himself the true protector of the Holy See, and argued that papal ports be closed to any nation that France was at war with. He threatened to occupy Rome and reduce the Pope to the status of mere bishop, and claimed the Pope should treat him like Charlemagne. He wrote, Your Holiness is the sovereign of Rome, but I am its emperor. All of my enemies ought to be yours. Napoleon's demeanor toward the church became that of a dominator. He decided he wanted a weak church that would act as his pet and rubber stamp all of the wars and policies he wanted. He sought to create a liberal version of Catholicism led by people like himself who were more deist than Catholic. Naturally, the church had to resist all of this. It risked the loss of something far more important than a few cities, its spiritual power and mission. Unfortunately for the Pope, the Catholics of France had become smitten by Napoleon's many victories, and this blinded them to their emperor's false view of how their church should be run. The Pope's cardinals ultimately voted to reject Napoleon's demands. Pius VII, in a very beautiful letter, declared that the Pope had no right to embroil himself with France's enemies, and he finished by making clear there was no Emperor of Rome. If our words fail to touch your majesty's heart, we will suffer with the resignation comfortable to the gospel. We will accept every kind of calamity as coming from God. This irritated Napoleon, and he moved from words to deeds. Several new papal cities were occupied by French troops. In front of his whole court, he angrily shouted at the papal diplomat Giovanni Caprara that he would dismember the papal states if Pius VII did not at once, without ambiguity or reservation, declare himself his ally. But wars were once again taking up Napoleon's attention from the Catholic situation. Prussia was the next country he laid low, smashing it in the War of the Fourth Coalition. Prussia was occupied and stripped of key territories, effectively terminated as a major power. It was in Berlin that Napoleon decreed the famous Continental Blockade of Britain, seeking to shut the continent to British commerce. He then defeated Russia, forcing them to join the Continental System. After this victory, Napoleon's empire controlled almost all of Western and Central Europe. At home, the emperor's personal power was becoming more firmly established, the supervision of the press more rigorous, summary incarcerations more frequent. To Napoleon, it was humiliating that the papal states still refused to politically join France in its wars. But Pius VII was a determined man and stood steadfast in his stance that the Pope couldn't consider the enemies of France his enemies also. In July 1807, Napoleon wrote to Prince Eugene of Milan, There were kings before there were popes. Any pope who denounced me to Christendom would cease to be pope in my eyes. I would look upon him as Antichrist. Does the pope take me for Louis the Pious? This is the last time I will enter into any discussion with the Roman priest rabble. In 1808, Pius VII finally offered to join the Continental Blockade and to suspend all diplomacy with the British, but not to declare war against them. He even wrote to Napoleon to come to visit Rome. Napoleon had never actually been to Rome for his entire life. But Napoleon was now seeking any excuse for a conflict. He told the Pope's diplomats that one-third of the cardinals should belong to the French Empire, and he said that he'd soon demand the Holy See to respect the Gallican liberties. What this shows is that it was the spiritual authority of the Church that Napoleon now aspired to control. Pius VII ordered his ministers to reject all such demands. France responded by invading the Papal States in a surprise attack, and the region was annexed to the Empire. The College of Cardinals was decimated as foreign cardinals were deported, and the Papal government became disorganized. The Imperial government declared that the Pope was to become a Prince of the Empire, with a salary from the state, and the Empire would take control of all Papal newspapers. Diplomatic relations between Pope and Emperor were at their lowest. Pius VII denounced the religious indifferentism of the government and forbade the faithful of the stolen provinces to swear allegiance. But Napoleon was now drunk with power. Later in the year, he launched an invasion of Spain, starting the Peninsular War. Spain was a Catholic nation, and Spaniards fought ferociously because they realized they were fighting not only for their country, but for the integrity of their faith. 
Napoleon's antagonism to the Pope had backfired in this regard. The Portuguese and the English also fought alongside the Spanish through Iberia. Their lead commander was the famous Arthur Wellesley, better known as the Duke of Wellington. French forces became bogged down in Spain and it would become Napoleon's Vietnam. To quote Georges Goyou, French armies in Spain would exhaust their strength in a savage and ineffectual war against a ceaseless uprising of the native population. By now, Pius VII was despondent at Napoleon's actions and declared him excommunicated. Napoleon, in turn, had Pius arrested and brought to France. Though it may seem like Napoleon was unfazed by all this, in reality the situation caused him anxiety and embarrassment. He ordered all French newspapers to be silent about his excommunication and the Pope's arrest. But despite this, Catholic groups in France circulated the news. Napoleon was furious, but he had an even bigger problem to deal with. Many bishop vacancies in his empire needed to be filled, and the Pope was the only one who could approve them. Pius VII refused to cooperate without being fully reunited with all of his cardinals. To address this dilemma, Napoleon assembled a French Catholic council. But to his dismay, the council declared that for religious questions to be settled, the Pope's presence was necessary. Meanwhile, in the Roman provinces, over half of the bishops of the region refused the oath of allegiance to the empire and were imprisoned. Despite his captivity, the Pope used secret agencies to publish papal bulls that defied all of Napoleon's attempts to reorganize the church. One of these was the Knights of the Faith, founded by Count Ferdinand de Berthier. His new society sought to counter masonry, free the Pope, and restore the Bourbons. There seemed to be no solution of the internal crisis of the Church of France. In 1811, Napoleon tried to come up with a solution. He ordered his French council to allow the ordination of bishops without the Pope. In other words, he effectively sought to cut the Pope out of Catholicism. The council assembled in Notre Dame and pro-papal voices won out, stating that nothing could be done without the Pope's presence. A series of negotiations were held, but all failed to achieve the goals Napoleon wanted. He demanded that Pius abdicate. Pius' answer was simple, never. Both sides were in complete deadlock, but events were about to take place that would change everything. In 1812, this is what a map of Europe looked like. Almost all of the continent was a French subject or ally. The continental system was destroying British commerce and embarrassing the other European states. The Russian economy was also badly suffering from the blockade. Because of this, Tsar Alexander decided to break from Napoleon and ally Russia with Britain. Though French armies were still bogged down in Spain, Napoleon made the fateful decision that the only response to the Tsar's actions was to invade Russia. Napoleon feared that the British would try to free the Pope, so he had him move to Fontainebleau. Pius was expected to appear in public and officiate, but he refused, and would lead a solitary life in the interior of the palace, giving no indication of being ready to yield on any of his principles. When Napoleon set out for Russia, it was his idea to extend his march all the way to India, to knock over the scaffolding of mercantile greatness raised by the English, and strike England to the heart. After this, it will be possible to settle everything, and have done with this business of Rome and the Pope. The Cathedral of Paris will become that of the Catholic world. The French invasion of Russia started successfully, but ended in catastrophe. The Russians engaged in scorched earth tactics, leaving the French armies to march through a wasteland. The French captured Moscow and hoped to spend the winter there, but the Russians intentionally burned huge sections of the city to the ground, making this plan impossible. The invasion had to be called off, and the retreat of the Grand Armée back west, in winter, cost France the lives of hundreds of thousands of soldiers. Napoleon rushed back to Paris and crushed a Republican conspiracy against him, but the diplomatic situation had turned decisively against France. Prussia had joined Russia and Britain, and Austria also was waiting for the opportune moment to strike. In the wake of this turn of events, Napoleon's arrogant attitude towards the church suddenly changed. He wrote with his own hand an affectionate letter to the Pope trying to end their dispute, but still made outrageous demands. The Pope, seeing the bad diplomatic situation Napoleon was in, knew that all he had to do now was wait. Napoleon tried to appoint bishops himself without the Pope, but they were rejected by French Catholics as illegitimate. The Emperor's perils were increasing on all sides. The French were finally driven out of Spain, 
Sweden, led by one of Napoleon's own veterans, Bernadotte, joined against him. Under Schwarzenberg, Blücher, Bernadotte, and Alexander I, four armies marched against France. Napoleon had 280,000 men against 500,000. The decisive Battle of the Nations at Leipzig in October 1813 opened the way for the Allies to enter France itself. The liberation of the Pope was on their list of objectives. While Napoleon continued to win some battles in heroic fashion, his great empire started to fall apart. Marshal Marat joined the Allies and occupied the Roman provinces on his own accord. Napoleon offered to restore the Papal States to the Pope, but Pius VII declared that such a restitution was an act of justice and could not be made the subject of a treaty. The Allies battled their way through France, and among other things, demanded the liberation of the Pope. At last, Napoleon sent orders to let Pius make his way to Italy. On March 10, 1814, the captivity of Pius VII came to an end. Despite valiant fighting by Napoleon, by March 31st, the Allies entered Paris. On April 3rd, the French Senate declared Napoleon dethroned. On May 4th, he was sent as a captive to Elba. He tried returning to rule France in 1815, but the coalition immediately reformed against him. They marched on France with more than 800,000 soldiers, to Napoleon's 180,000 recruits. He lost at Waterloo and was finally exiled to the remote island of St. Helena, this time for good. The peace treaty drawn up by the coalition restored the European borders to what they were before any French expansion, with some adjustments that benefited themselves. The Papal States were restored almost fully intact, and the Catholic Bourbon dynasty once again ruled France. Pius VII stood tall after the two-decade-long battle of wills between Pope and Emperor. In his captivity, Napoleon asked for a chaplain. He said, it would rest my soul to hear Mass. Pope Pius held no ill will against him and petitioned Britain to grant his wish, and they did so. When Napoleon was close to dying in 1821, he told his priest, I was born in the Catholic religion. I wish to fulfill the duties it imposes and receive the succor it administers. To the French General Montholon, he affirmed his belief in God and read aloud the Bible. He spoke of Pius VII as an old man full of tolerance and light. Fatal circumstances embroiled our cabinets. I regret it exceedingly. He took his final breath and passed away on May 5, 1821. Napoleon was not an anti-Christian or an unbeliever, but he wouldn't admit that anyone was above himself, not even the Pope. He once said, Alexander the Great declared himself the son of Jupiter, and in my time I find a priest who is more powerful than I am. His pride and boundless ambition helped him on the battlefield, but tainted his religious policy. He won the sympathies of the Catholic world with the Concordat of 1801, ending years of horrible anti-Catholic persecution. But his attempt to infringe on the spiritual power of the Pope was precisely the same mistake that his predecessors made with the civil constitution of the clergy. He should have known better. Napoleon was the successor of Charlemagne and Constantine, but failed to keep the friendliness with the papacy that those great emperors had. Personally, I have a fondness for this era of history because it featured many honorable Christian rulers. It was one of the last eras of warfare led by an aristocracy, as well as where kings and generals participated personally in battle. There were many good and intelligent people on all sides who did what they thought was best for their countries. Even though Napoleon was defeated, many of the reforms he spread through Europe remained in place. He saved the French Revolution from collapse, but also moderated its worst elements. Whether his legacy was for better or for worse is still debated to this day. In the West in our current time, many Enlightenment values that were pushed in the revolutionary era have become dominant. Just to name some of the most harmful, they include the idea that the laws of man are more important than the laws of God. Both the Revolution and Napoleon championed an egalitarian myth that allowed for a new, plutocratic establishment to emerge over all of society. The normalization of mass conscription also laid the foundation for total war and the world would feel the consequences of that in World War I and II. But regardless of all this, the story of Napoleon and Pius VII is a case of church leaders standing by their principles and never giving up on their core spiritual values, even in the face of overwhelming force. No matter what the secular authorities did, even stripping the church of its material possessions, even arresting the Pope, they never gave up. We Christians in the West today, facing many who demand that we give up our values, can learn a lot from Pius VII and his allies.
This has been PAX, and thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to see more videos, please consider supporting the channel. Also, leave a comment letting me know your thoughts on everything. As always, I will see you in the next video.